What's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 20, and we're going to look at Exodus 7 through 9. So let's jump right into it. Today, we're going to be looking specifically at the plagues, the 10 plagues. Why would God attack false gods? And I've heard it put this way by a theologian. It's basically what you would call a war of appearance or a war of demonstration. You say, what do you mean by that? Think about it like our children and the boogeyman. Uh, our kids come to us and say, mom, dad, I'm afraid of the boogeyman. He's under my bed. What do we do? We tell them that there is no such thing, but then we go under and look under the bed and open the covers up and say, I told you there's nothing here. And so this is basically what God is doing. He's declaring war on these false gods, and he's giving a war of appearance and demonstration. As we know, we'll see this in Deuteronomy, that there's no such thing as false gods. They have no life. The only thing behind them is demonic influence. Now, the Egyptian pantheon is not just 10 gods. They have tons of gods, multiple gods. The god of the sun, they have god of cattle, and we'll see even here, God of bulls, and we'll work through some of these today. And what God is going to do here, he's going to work his way up from easy boss all the way to top boss himself. And we know who top boss he is. It's Mr. Pharaoh himself who declared last time we saw is, who is Yahweh? I do not know Yahweh. And so God is about to show him who he is. And so this is the way that these attacks are going to happen. They're broken up in one through three, four through six, seven through nine, and 10. And so pay attention to the way I divvy those up because that's going to be important. It's going to be important based on two things, their impact and their threat level. Their impact meaning how many and their threat level meaning how severe. And so the first play we get here in chapter seven, it's the now being turned to blood. So if we grab that here in verse 17, it says, by this, you shall know that I'm the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned to blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die and the Nile will become foul and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. So we have it in verse 20. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord commanded and lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of the servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died and the Nile became foul. So the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile and the blood was through all the land of Egypt. This is an attack on the first guy we said his name is Happy, H-A-P-I, Happy. And so he's the God of the spirit of the now. And so basically what God has done here is he says, I've killed Happy. Happy is dead. That's why we see blood there. God is showing them. It's a crime scene here. Happy is dead. And I like to say Happy is now sad. He's killed Happy. But I want us to notice something. We talked about false teachers and the magicians and the practices of the secret arts being able to counterfeit this. So look at verse 22. It says, but the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts and Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. And this is weird for a few reasons. Like, why would you turn your own water to blood when all of this water has already been turned to blood? So it's dumb, but we're not even going to get on that. What we're going to talk about is they had the ability to do this as well. And let's notice the reason I organized these from one to three. Watch what happens after the third plague. And so let's move to the second one. First, I want to grab this in chapter eight. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. In your text, it may say serve. But the literal translation of that is slave. And I love the beauty of this because we will have to bring this out because slavery was a very important concept back then that we will have to learn. 
And it's hard for us to talk about slavery because we have our thinking clouded and our, our memories are just so convoluted with the transatlantic slave trade, with chattel slavery and with antebellum slavery. And we can't think through those lenses in order to understand this. There is some language that we'll have to employ here soon called suzerain vassal language. And so there is a suzerain vassal treaty that a suzerain and a vassal would enter into. So when you are a master, you enter into a covenant with a slave. And so God is going to start tying into this language saying, Look, you need to move from that master. Let them go from him so they can slave me and I'll be their master. And so God is going to say, I'll be your master, but I'll be a better master. I won't be a taskmaster because something we'll learn and we'll talk about this more around Exodus 19 when we get the purpose of Israel about what God is going to command from his subjects and the type of master that he's going to be. And it's going to blow our minds because it's, anti any of the language we ever see regarding how masters were during that time. They were very harsh. They were very egotistical. Everything was directed toward them and how you could serve them and how you could be subservient to them. And they had no love and affection for their slaves. And so God is going to turn all of that on its head. But let's continue to read. So the next plague that happens, let's grab in verse six, it says, so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. So this guy name is Het and that's H-E-Q-T. That's the frog goddess of Egypt. And he's related to fertility. And I thought this was interesting because think about what this is saying. They had a God of fertility. But Exodus started out showing that they couldn't beat the Hebrews in childbearing. And so their God isn't even effective. It's showing that God had already poked at this guy saying, look, the women, the midwives saying they're outpacing the Egyptian women and we can't get there in time. And God has said, look, not only does that God not work, he's dead now. I control hate. And so we have heck, but look at verse seven. The magicians did the same thing with their secret arts, making the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. They copy it. And we're not going to get into why would you copy frogs everywhere? It's already a nuisance. It's already a piss. And you're just going to put more out here. Okay, we won't deal with that again. But they're able to do it. Let's note that. So he relents. He relents in verse 13. The Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. So they piled them up in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. And so there we go. We have Pharaoh hardening his own heart here, and we're going to see those dynamics of hardening and him hardening his heart, the Lord hardening his heart. So pay attention to that as we go. So here's number three. It says in verse 16, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike dust of the ground that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. They did so and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth and there were gnats on man and beasts. So we now have this kind of a lice, these gnats everywhere. And this is the God Seb, S-E-B the earth God of Egypt. So that said, but look here, when we get here, this is so powerful. Look at verse 18. It says, the magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth the nets, but they could not. So the nets were on man and beast. And look at what happens. Verse 19, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So we have to stop here and talk about this. And so this is why we wanted to separate them from one through three, four through six, seven through nine and 10. So right at three, you have the magicians able to replicate and duplicate these, these miracles, but they can't do it at number three. But, but God gets their attention 
Look at what they say. They say, Pharaoh, look, I don't know what's going on here, but this is only the finger of God. And we can't even replicate this. We can't duplicate this. But this God is powerful. We do not know who we're messing with. So they're getting a warning here. And even his magicians are telling him, look, we may want to back off here because we don't know who we're dealing with. But let's continue to read. It says in verse 23, and I love this, it says, I will put division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. And so now impact and intensity is about to increase. And the reason we divide the, these plagues is because of this verse here in verse 23. The plagues are now about to start harming people. Up until now, the plagues have been affecting everybody. But now God is saying, no, I'm about to divide my people. And now the plagues will only affect the Egyptians. And so here's the fourth plague. It says, then the Lord did so, and there came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and the houses of the servant, and it laid waste. And so you have this swarm of flies here, and this is the God you at it, and it's U-A-T-C-H-I-T. This is the fly God of Egypt, and it's like a scarab fly. And it would, if you had to compare it to something today, it would be like a horse fly that could take chunks of your skin out. So now the impact is on Egypt and Israel is not touched. Then we move into chapter nine and we have our next plague, which is the fifth, number five. And we pick up number five in verse three. It says, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction. You see this? Between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die, all that belongs to the sons of Israel. So God is protecting his people. And we have to get this to see how loving our God is. God is saying, look, I'm not going to mess with my children. I let my children experience the first three so they can see how serious this is and their hearts can be sober when I enter into the rest of these. But now impact and intensity is about to form and I'm not going to let my people be involved in this. But verse seven, Pharaoh sent and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. And so the God we have here, number five, is Hathor. That's H-A-T-H-O-R, Hathor. And it's an e Egyptian God associated with bulls and cows. And so you see what God is doing here? He's walking down all of the gods and attacking them and declaring war on them. Then we move into our sixth plague, which is bulls. So we'll grab that in verse nine. It will become fine dust all over the land of Egypt and will become bulls breaking out with sores on man and beasts through all the land of Egypt. But now look at what happens here. Let's grab this guy. This is number six. So this is segment and it's S-E-K-H-M-E-T. Segment is an Egyptian God of epidemics. So God attacks this God. And look at what happens in verse 11. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the bulls, for the bulls were on the magicians as well as all the magicians. Look at this. Look how powerful this is. The magicians who were counterfeiting, the magicians who were duplicating the works of God now have the plagues on them. Not only can they perform them, they're being affected by them now. They're full of bulls. And it says this. Now they're so decimated that they cannot even stand before Pharaoh. This is so powerful. And I want to grab this interesting note from verse 20. Look at this. It says, the one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servant and his livestock in the field. 
So even Egypt is starting to listen to Yahweh. You see how powerful this is? God is moving. God is acting. And Egypt, people in Egypt are starting to get the picture and they're starting to obey the word of the Lord. This is the God we serve. And this is the power of the God we serve. And then we move into our seven plague. We got three more. So let's grab these, our seven plague. And this is in verse 23. It says, Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. And so this is our seven plague. This is hail. This is the God Nut, N-U-T, the Egyptian sky God. And so he's attacked him. And I want you to see what's going on here. And actually, we're running out of time. This is actually good because the locusts and the darkness and then the firstborn are in chapter 10, 11, and 12. So we'll pick those up tomorrow. But I do want to talk about a few things here. I want you to see what God is doing. He's utterly obliterating this, this superpower. He's putting bulls on them. He's putting hell on them. So hell is attacking the crops that they have growing. And next we'll see tomorrow that he's going to bring locusts. So locusts will attack the crops that they had stored up. So they literally have nothing to survive off of. And you can even read in the ancient archives. And my professor would read these documents and it would talk about just this catastrophe that happened in Egypt. They don't explain why it happened. They don't attribute it to Yahweh, but it was this natural catastrophe. And how do we explain it? Maybe 10 plagues, maybe Yahweh declaring war on Pharaoh. And another reason we say, why 10? Why 10? I think this is very interesting because it was so many gods and they were attached to creation. They were attached to being powerful and ruling the world. And so a lot of theologians have made this connection and I really like it. I don't know how hard I want to hold on to it, but it's something to put in the back of your mind because I have it in the back of mind to chew on every now and then. If you go back to Genesis 1, when God spoke and created, guess how many times he spoke? You guessed it, 10. He spoke 10 times. And so a lot of people say, false gods, you did not create the earth. You do not own any of these elements. I do. I spoke 10 times and I'm going to go to war on 10 gods. And I think that is a very powerful connection. I don't think it's a stretch, but it is something that we need to chew on a little more. But if that connection checks out, think about the beauty in that and think about how God, as the young people say, keeps receipts. He doesn't play around. And this is the God that we serve a God who separates his people, he protects his people. And I just have to end on an illustration. There was this story that I heard about two kids that were on a bus and both of them got off the bus and went and played and got their brand new shoes dirty. And both of them went home. One kid said, hey, mom, I'm home. And she said, boy, why are your shoes so dirty? So he gets in trouble, he gets disciplined, and he says, but mom, my friend did the exact same thing, and his his shoes are just as dirty. And guess what the mom said? That's not my son. I separate my son, and I discipline, and I deal with my children differently. And that's what we see about our God here. A lot of times we wonder why we go through certain things that other people don't. While we get disciplined for certain things that other people don't, it's almost like Asaph. Asaph said, why are the evil prospering? Why do they have healing in their body? Why do they live long lives? Why are they prosperous? Why are they rich? And then he looked up and said, but then I entered the house of God and I saw their end. This is Psalm 73, by the way. I saw their end. And it's destruction. And it's the true understanding That's when you come to the true realization of knowing, man, everybody is God's creation. But let's be clear. Everybody is not God's children. And God deals with his children differently. 
He disciplines his children differently. And beloved saints, hold on. Don't be discouraged when you're being disciplined. Be encouraged because that's a true mark that you are a legitimate son and daughter. That's a true mark that God loves you. Just like he separated his children from the impact and the intensity of the plagues, he separates you in this life to sanctify you and to conform you into the image of his son. So don't look up at the world and be discouraged and don't look up at the world and feel that you're missing out on something. You are not missing out. Jesus is precious and you do not understand the eternal weight of glory that awaits you for being on this journey. I has not seen or ear has not heard what God has in store for you, beloved saints. You all take care and we'll pick up next time in chapters 10 through 12. Love you guys. Praying for you. Have a good day. Yeah.